Okay, good morning. Welcome to Friday Compass Seminar. Today we have Luna Huron. She is a fifth year PhD candidate in the Meteorology and Physical Oceanography Department here at Rasmus. Her advisor is uh, Nick Shea. In uh, 2014, she received a bachelor's degree in oceanography from the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florinopolis, Brazil. Um, today, she's going to be talking about the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, I should also mention she was a intern at um, BIOS in Bermuda for two years um, in 2015 and 2016. And the title of her talk today is um, also the, the title of her thesis, which is Intensification of Loop Current Frontal Eddies and Their Interactions with the Loop Current and Surrounding Flow. So Luna, thank you so much for presenting today and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Anne. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay, great. Okay, um, so my research um, is about the intensification of the loop current frontal eddies and their interaction with the loop current and the surrounding flow. This research is funded by Gumry. My advisor is um, Nick Shea and my PhD committee is composed by Dave Nolan, Benjamin Hymas, Bill Johns, and uh, Peter Hamilton, which is um, my external. So the outline of this presentation, first I'm going to give a brief introduction of the loop current system and talk about motivation. Then I'll go um, to my three chapters of uh, my PhD research. So um, the loop current system is composed of the first one is the loop current, the, which is the main current and the most ener energetic feature in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see in this SSH video that shows um, the black line is the contour used to identify the loop current, which is a 17 centimeter SSH contour. Everything that is in red is everything that is above um, 17 centimeter. And so the loop current flows from the Yucatan channel, um, enters the Gulf of Mexico, turns on cyclonically and exits through the Florida Strait. Um, every six to 17 months, the loop current becomes unstable and develop these meanders um, and leads, which leads to a shedding of a loop current eddy. So loop current eddy um, propagates westward towards Mexico. And finally, we have the last feature, which is the loop current frontal eddies. These are the blue blobs that you see surrounding the loop current. They're cyclonic cold core air eddies that are in solid body rotation. Their diameters can go up to 120 kilometers and they're generated by barotropic and baroclinic instability of the loop current. So the ones that are on the west coast on the loop current, they're usually too small to be seen on satellite and they're, they're generated through barotropic instability. Whereas the one on the north part and the east side of the loop current, they're much larger and they're generated, generated through baroclinic instability. And the Zetas then can intensify and play a role in the shedding of the loop current. So you have loop current, loop current frontal eddies, and the loop current eddies. And in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on this period of intensification. So in the last stage of the loop current um, shedding before or right after. So why do we care about the intensification of the frontal eddies? Um, first, we know that these frontal eddies, they can go, grow and constrict the neck of the loop current, leading to a shedding event. And this shedding event has still is still a open question in the oceanography community because we don't fully understand the mechanism. We know that it's mainly driven through baroclinic instability, but we're not able to predict so far. So the goal is to be able to predict at least two or three weeks before the shedding. That's what um, projects are currently happening um, to try to predict when the shedding is going to happen. And why do we care about that is one of the main reasons because 
these eddies, they carry water that spin quite fast. So the velocities can reach values of two meters per second. And when they propagate on the west side of the Gulf of Mexico, they go over regions where there's oil platforms. And so these oil platforms, they have to shut down and stop all the operations every time there is an eddy passing through um, due to the high turbulence. And so this is one of the reasons why predicting the loop current shedding is important and understanding better the frontal edges could help us understanding and predicting the loop current shedding. Uh, the loop current frontal edges, they, only, they don't only affect the loop current, but they also affect the local circulation. So during the 2010 deep, deep water horizon oil spill, we observed that part of the oil was entrained around and inside a frontal edge in the north part of the loop current. And uh, that went against what the forecast had predicted. We, the forecast actually predicted that the oil would flow the loop current and reach the Florida Keys. So we're quite lucky to have um, this frontal adding intensifying over here. But I also showed that uh, the forecast, the, the forecast models, they don't account for these intensification um, events. Um, the loop current and the frontal edges can also affect hurricane intensity. So the loop current is um, has an anticyclonic motion. So it has a deep ocean mix layer and stores a lot of heat, which can serve as fuel to hurricane intensification. On the other hand, the frontal edges are cyclonic features. So they have shallower ocean mix layers and isotherms, which bring more cold water from the deep layers to the upper layers. And we can see here in the this ocean heat content map, it's a lot of heat on the loop current and a lot of, well, um, more cold waters um, where a uh, loop current frontal eddy is. And so this frontal eddy is they can actually weaken, I uh, can act weaken hur um, hurricane intensity or at least delaying the int intensification. So for this specific case of Hurricane Laura, we actually saw that we had favorable conditions for intensification, except for this presence of loop current frontal eddy that end up delaying the intensification. And finally, the frontal edges can also affect fisheries. Um, since uh, the loop current frontal edges, they have shallower mixed layer, they uh, bring cold waters from the deep layers to the surface, but not only cold waters, they also bring nutrients. So we have a little map of loop current, loop current eddy, and a frontal edge in between. And when, um, in this paper, the second panel shows the cross-section thermal structure, you can see that the isotherms are much more inclined and, uh, and towards the lower, uh, lower layers and the frontal eddies. And so bringing nutrients to the surface increases the concentration of phytoplankton, zooplankton, and can also bring more food for fish and marine animals. So we know we know quite a large amount of information about the frontal edges, but no deep study has also looked at the interaction between intensification and the loop current front, or understanding how uh, this frontal edges can modify the local circulation. So um, the question the the questions arise are when and where the frontal edges intensify, and how intensified frontal edges interact with the loop current. Um, I then ask myself, how geostrophic, how geostrophic is this interaction? And finally, are the frontal edges Lagrangian coherent structures? We know that they are in solid body rotation, but are they able to actually transport water material from one place to another, which is a definition of Lagrangian coherence? And if they can, for how long can they remain coherent? And what are the implications of this intensification to the surrounding flow? So these are the three chapters of uh, my research. So the first one goes um, focuses on the frontal edge intensification and interactions with the loop current, and I um, will show the main results of, results of this part that shows when and where they intensify and how they interact with the front. So these results were published in 2020 on JGR Oceans with um, Nick and uh, Benjamin. So for this um, study, I used sea surface height and geostrophic velocities from a FISO for the period of 2009, 2011. And for this period, I tracked the loop current and the loop current frontal eddies for this three year period. So the loop current was tracked using the 17 centimeter SSH counter as was previously defined. And for the frontal eddies, there is no counter defined. So I 
defined for this 38 threshold, the negative 28 centimeters SH contour, that mostly tracks the strongest frontalitis. And these are the ones that I would like to focus more because they're the ones that play a bigger role in the shedding. Um, and so the loop current is easy to track since they're like opening a open contour, right? So even after a shedding, we will still have a open contour on um, the southern part of the Gulf of Mexico. The frontal frontalitis were a bit more tricky to track. So the way that I track them, I look at every contour that was closed, so had a loop. And to find if a contour, or if an eddy was the same as the one of the time step before, I look at this, their center. If the center from one time step to another of the eddy was less than 20 kilometers, then I consider them as the same eddy. And then I calculated kinetic energy and look also the variability in sister phase height and area for loop current and loop current frontalitis. And then I use a tone morning array from the loop current dynamic experiment for the same time period, 2009, 2011. Um, the location of the tone morings are shown by the gray um, diamonds here. So there are nine of them. And they measure total zonal and meridional velocities and temperature. And I apply the objective analysis on where you see the solid line around using Marianne and Brown 1992 method to obtain a 4D field of velocity and temperature. So the first results are focused on this tracking of the loop current and loop current frontal radius. So I calculate integrated kinetic energy of the loop current, um, which is shown in the red lines and of the loop current frontal radius, which are the blue lines during 2009, 2011 period. And you can see that every dashed line is an abrupt decrease in integrated kinetic energy, which corresponds to when a shedding happened. So you have a decrease in the area mostly. So you have a decrease in the integrated kinetic energy. And um, the names correspond to names of the loop current eddies, because we, we do like a hurricane scientists, we name our loop current eddies. So you have Ekman, Franklin, and Hadal. And uh, I want you to mostly focus where the black areas are. That's when we had frontal eddies that were the strongest. And this corresponds to mostly periods of either the loop current is shedding or it was reattached and reshedding, which is the case over here or in this case over here, it was a bit before the shedding. So um, what we can see is that the stronger frontal eddies, they happen during the last stage of the loop current when they're mostly unstable, when you start meandering, before, right before the shedding or during a shedding and reshedings. When I look at the location for the strongest frontal eddies, and I plotted, um, so each black dot is shown at the position where the frontal eddy has its highest kinetic energy. We don't really see a pattern. You have all this location a bit spread around the loop current. And this is a mean SSH of the loop current position for the whole period, for the three-year period. And you don't really see a relationship or a place that intensifies more than another. But if you put the intensification of the frontal eddies in another framework, so in a framework of, of the distance between the frontal eddy and the loop current, then you see a closer relationship. So I, the same way that I tracked this frontal eddies, I also calculated the um, distance between the frontal eddy and the loop current, and I plotted um, the kinetic energy for the frontal eddy, the area, and the SSH as a function of this distance. And I found that there is an exponential relationship. So as the distance between the frontal eddy and the loop current decreases, I found an exponential increase in kinetic energy and increase in the area, so these eddies are getting larger, and a negative or a negative increase in SSH, which is expected since we have a cyclonic feature as it intensifies, the SSH um, goes down to um, towards more negative values. But this interaction between the frontal head and the front not only happens at the surface, it actually happens also below the surface. So to study the interaction below the surface, I used the Mooring Array. Um, and I looked at two specific cases, one case with a weak frontal eddy, which is this case here, and another case with a strong frontal eddy. And I look at the cross-section thermal structure, which is um, shown by the black thick line 
And on the right side, you have so the thermal structure from um, 100 meter to 1200 meters. And the white line are the velocity. So you have the dashed line or the negative velocity coming towards us, uh, which so this um, strong front is actually the front combine of the loop current and the frontal eddy. And then on the other hand side, you have a bit of positive velocity, which is um, due to the loop current of so velocity going northward. And so you can see that comparing these two cases, you have a much stronger horizontal um, temperature gradient for the case of a strong frontal eddy. So as the frontal eddy intensifies, it tilts the isotherms, intensifies the flow and makes it deeper. So you can see like around this 0 0.8 uh, meters squared velocity here and in intensified cases, a bit more deeper and a larger region. So we didn't, we observed a 30% increase in the density gradient. Um, and we also look at the variability in available potential energy in the loop current. So when this frontal eddy, so this is another case of weak and strong frontal eddy, I computed available potential energy inside the loop current using the temperature from the morning. And I took a salinity, constant salinity of 35 PSU. And um, I integrated this available potential energy and observe that in the case of a strong frontal eddy, there is an increase in 22% of uh, the local available potential energy. So although um, the frontal eddies were shown to be uh, formed, generated through Berkeley instability, which means that the frontal eddy is actually, um, so the loop current is providing available potential energy to the eddy kinetic energy field. This is happening in a, um, loop current length scale, but locally, frontal eddies can be strong enough that they can deform the loop current and through vortex um, squeezing and stretching can also lead uh, to a local increase in available potential energy. Um, so we show that this, the interaction can be linear through the tilting of the isotherm, but there's also a nonlinear component of this interaction. And um, to look at that, I, again, using the method to track the frontal eddies, I um, looked at the distance. So I tracked this distance and I calculated the rise of the number on this segment uh, between the loop current and the loop current frontal eddy front. And the rise number was calculated um, with uh, the satellite data and as the ratio of the relative vorticity and the Coriolis parameter. And I found that as the distance decreased, the mean Rosby number between the loop current and the frontal eddy increases exponentially. So Douglas and Richmond 2015 define high nonlinearity as Rosby number equals 0 0.3. And if we take this um, threshold here, then for distance smaller than 100 kilometers, we have high nonlinearity between the frontal eddy and the loop current. This results particularly important because it gave rise to my second chapter that I will be talking a little bit more where I investigate a geostrophy in the loop current system. So the conclusion of the chapter one are the intensification of the frontal eddies um, happens during the last stage of the loop current when they're mostly unstable. Um, so before and during the shedding um, is dependent on the loop current, loop current frontal eddy distance and can interact linear and non-linear with the loop current, increasing the horizontal density gradient, the local available potential energy and the Rosby number between in the, in the front between these two features. So for my second chapter, um, I study the geostrophic flow in the loop current system during frontal eddy intensification. And uh, for a long time, the loop current system has been assumed to be close to geostrophic balance, although we observe this strong meanders and associated frontal eddies during the shedding. So from chapter one, we observe that there is the, the, this interaction uh, increased the nonlinearity in the loop current front. So you have high Rosman numbers and high nonlinearity goes against the assumptions for uh, geostrophic balance. And finally, uh, there are many cases of studies of strong eddies around the world that are shown to be in gradient imbalance. So these eddies that become 
for some reason, they're so strong that they can, the centrifugal force becomes important. So not only the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force are important, which is the geostrophic balance, they also have this third component centrifugal force that makes this eddies in gradient, gradient wind balance. So this is one of the studies uh, by Bevin et al. 2014 in the Mozambique channel um, and this study of ageostrophy um, for this specific eddies. So that made me ask, um, how does the nonlinearity in the front affects the loop current flow? And how geostrophic, ageostrophic is this loop current frontal eddy and loop current interaction? So these results were published in JPO um, last month with uh, Nick Shea and Dave Nolan. So for this study, I used two data sets. The first one is a one kilometer resolution free run HICOM with absolute winds. They ran this model for from 1994 to 2003. So you're gonna see that all my plots using the model are, well, for old cases, but this is a free run. So they're not realistic cases, right? We're here like mostly to, uh, we use this model mostly to understand the dynamics and sister phase height and geostrophic velocities from Avisa. Um, so first I um, checked if the HICOM model and altimetry capture the nonlinearity for the cases that I was studying. So I plotted for three different cases. So as I mentioned before, this 1999, 2000, 2001 case for HICOM, and I took more recent cases for the altimetry data set. And for all the cases, it's either, uh, this case are either doing a loop current shedding or a bit before, but all of them in the presence of a strong frontal wedding. And you can see for all the cases, the Rosby number that was defined before um, has shown very high values in the front. So the Rosby numbers are all uh, equal one or even higher values. So that verifies the nonlinearity that was found in uh, my first chapter. And then I did a first check to see if the loop current was actually in gradient wind balance. So I used a method um, used previously by Douglas in Richmond 2015. And um, so the gradient wind balance in a, in a natural coordinate system can be written in this form, where we have the first term is the Coriolis force, uh, the centrifugal force, the second term is the Coriolis force, and the third one, the pressure gradient force. Um, VG is the, VGR is the gradient wind velocity, and it's actually the magnitude or the norm of, of the gradient wind velocity field. F, the Coriolis parameter, G, um, the gravity, and eta is SSH. And R is the radius of curvature of the flow, with R being positive for cyclonic motion and R being negative for anticyclonic motion. So if you replace the last term, the pressure gradient force, by FVG, which is the geostrophic or the norm of the geostrophic velocity field, um, this is the definition of geostrophic balance, then we obtain this equation over here. So assuming that we know the geostrophic velocity, the, Coria the Coriolis parameter, and the radius of curvature of the flow, then this equation becomes a quadratic equation with one unknown, and we can uh, find a solution. So you have this um, a solution, this form, which is the gradient wind velocity as a function of the geostrophic velocity, Coriolis parameter, and R, and the radius of curvature. So the tricky part here was actually to evaluate the radius of curvature, because in this study, Douglas and Richmond 2015, they only looked at eddies that have high, that had high circularity, and they calculated the radius uh, by uh, through the area of the eddy. But in our case here, we don't have a eddy. We have a loop current frontal eddy, but the high nonlinearity was mostly observed in the front between the loop current and the frontal eddy. So we have mostly meander that we want to study. Um, so to calculate the radius of curvature, we actually use a equation from Cohen et al. 2019. So this equation says that the curl of any vector field equals the, um, the shear uh, plus the curvature of this vector field, where A equals the norm of the vector field. So if we apply this equation to the velocity field, we obtain relative vorticity equals the shear plus the curvature. And if we define it by the amplitude, so then we're gonna have 
here it's already the amplitude of the velocity field, right? If I apply it to the velocity, if you divide it, then the shear vanishes and we obtain a relationship between the relative vorticity and the curvature and we can, um, and then we can isolate the radius of curvature. So we obtain this equation over here. And this equation allows us to calculate the radius of curvature around any given point using only the velocity film. All right, so um, we applied this first, these two equations to um, the model output. The first panel is the total velocity for one case. I will just show one case of H, one case for the model and another case for the altimetry. Um, and so for this case, the total velocity, oops, the um, total velocity is shown in the first panel for a case of loop current shedding in the presence of a strong frontal eddy. I calculated the angiostrophic velocity using sea surface height from the model. And when you compare the two, you can see the geostrophic velocity shows much higher velocities in the loop current, loop current frontal eddy front, with velocities reaching values of three meter per second. Whereas if you look at here, the total velocity, we have velocities of 1.5, two meter per second. Uh, and there is another little change that's a bit harder to see, but you also see that the geostrophic velocity have small, has smaller amplitudes in the loop current crest over here compared to the total velocity. So when we computed the gradient wind velocity using this equation, so based on the geostrophic velocity, we uh, actually correct for this um, for this acceleration, the loop current trough and the weakening in the loop current crest. Uh, and this gradient wind velocity, it's much closer. It's actually very, very similar to the total velocity. So um, this shows that our, the loop current meanders, in particular when in the presence of strong frontal eddies, is in gradient wind, in gradient wind balance. Um, and the last panel makes this difference between geostrophic velocity and gradient wind velocity much easier to see. So this is the difference between the two, gradient wind velocity minus geostrophic velocity. And you can see that the geostrophic component of the flow weakens the velocity and um, the geostrophic velocity in the loop current trough. So it's negative and strengthen the velocity in the loop current meander crest. The good news is that since the gradient wind velocity can be calculated from the geostrophic velocity, that we can apply that to other data sets, even if we don't have the total velocity. So I applied for this case of loop current shedding with a strong frontal eddy using sister phase height, height from altimetry. So we don't have total velocity. I just plotted the sister phase height for the first panel. Second panel shows the geostrophic velocity. And then I compute a gradient wind velocity uh, from this geostrophic velocity. And, uh, and then the last panel shows the difference between gradient wind velocity and the geostrophic velocity. So once again, you see the geostrophic component of the flow weakens the flow by um, 0 0.4 meter per second with the altimetry and strengthen it um, in the loop current crest. So the amplitude of this difference is much smaller than the model, which is um, expected since the um, since the model has one kilometer resolution and satellite has 25 kilometer resolution. Okay, so if you look at the balance of forces um, to understand more what's happening, we have here a straight line shows the loop current, dashed line a frontal eddy. We have L to low pressure center and a high pressure center. So in the loop current trough, well, for the two cases, you have pressure gradient force pointing on the left side of the flow, whereas the Coriolis force pointing on the right, we're in the Northern Hemisphere. And what modulates this balance and how the, and the magnitude of the gradient wind velocity and the geostrophic velocity is actually the centrifugal force. So the centrifugal force is always pointing outwards of the rotational flow. And so in this point in one direction for the crest and another direction for the trough. And as a consequence, we have for uh, the loop current trough, a gradient wind velocity that is smaller than the geostrophic velocities. That's why we call it subgeostrophic. And for the loop current 
crest, we have a gradient wind velocity that is larger than the geostrophic velocity, so we're in a case of super geostrophic. I just, uh, in this presentation, I just showed one case for the model and one case of study for the altimetry, but I actually did three cases each, which allowed me to calculate a mean a geostrophic percentage for the cyclonic and the anticyclonic with um, a standard, um, standard deviation. And I found that the geostrophic percentage of the flow in the cyclonic meander is of 47% for high comm and 31% with the altimetry data. And in the anticyclonic, it was 78% for each of them, which means that, for example, if I have a velocity field with a geostrophic velocity of one meter per second, my a geostrophic velocity can be as high as 70 at 0 0.78 meter per second. Um, yeah. So the conclusion for chapter two are that the curvature of the flow can be calculated from the velocity field around any given point. So that's the uh, formula that we derived. Um, the loop current meanders are in gradient wind balance. So the centrifugal force is important and modulates the balance. Um, so the geostrophic velocity can be corrected. That's the good news. But we have to take into account the resolution of the data set. So uh, this method works with satellite because we have 25 kilometer resolution, but we already saw magnitudes that are much smaller than compared to the model. So I feel 25 kilometer resolution is probably the limit to correct the geostrophic velocities to account for the centrifugal force. And finally, we found that the geostrophic component of the flow in the cyclonic and the anticyclonic meanders or in the loop current system is very important, in particular during loop current shedding or in the presence of strong frontal eddies. Okay, I'll drink some water. So that takes me to my third chapter, which focuses on the study of Lagrangian coherence and advection of surrounding waters during frontal eddy intensification. So what made me uh, wanted to look at how the frontal eddy affects the surrounding flow. The main motivation was again, the 2010 deep water horizon. We know that cyclonic and anticyclonic dipoles attract fluid. That's something that's well known. And that was also the case for loop current and loop current, loop current frontal eddy interaction. So there's some studies that have shown that these two features, when they interact, they attract chlorophyll and they also attracted oil, oil for um, the case of the oil spill. But what I thought was interesting is that um, these two features, for the case of the oil, it didn't only attract it, um, the parcels to its front, but actually it attracted to the interior of the frontal eddy, and this oil remained there for days and weeks after. And so that made me wonder if the frontal eddies were actually like Grange and coherent, which means they're, they're able to um, stock water in their interior and transport from one place to another without exchange to the exterior. Um, and there's another um, indication that the frontal eddies could be Lagrangian like coherent. When we look at the nonlinearity in the first and the second chapters, we actually found high Rosman numbers, right? And we know that nonlinearity also indicates that these uh, features have strong tangential velocity compared to the, their translation speed, which is a good indication for coherence and for the ability of traveling long distance, uh, preserving their, their water in the interior. So um, the questions that arise are the first part is gonna look at the Lagrangian coherence. So are they are the frontal eddies Lagrangian coherent structures? Can they transport fluids from one place to another without exchange to the exterior? If they can, how many days can they remain coherent? And how coherent are they in the lower levels? And then the second part, uh, we'll look at um, what are the implications of the intensification of the surrounding flow and can you drive cross shelf exchanges? To study um, the coherence of the frontal eddies, I use this method based on, so um, developed by George Haller and Javier Beranavetta, 
2013. So they developed this model to identify coherent Lagrangian vortices. And what this method uh, looks for is to find fluid regions enclosed by exceptional Lagrangian loops, that's how they call it, um, that defy the typical exponential stretching. So most of the loops or swirls in the ocean, what oceanographers, as oceanographers also call eddies, um, they um, experience exponential stretching. So as they move or get advected, they filament, they lose their water in their interior, although the energy of the swirl is also propagating, but it doesn't conserve energy from one time step to another. And so we're trying to find regions where there is not this exponential stretching. And, and so most of the case are in this incoherent box. So from one time step zero to time step T, um, you have exponential stretching in some parts of the contour, which make it break off and filament. But in a case of a coherent eddy, this, um, this loop is stretched by a constant value all around. And um, it's stretched by a parameter that we're gonna call lambda, but it's stretched in the same form. So this loop either shrinks or gets bigger, but it's still concentrated matter or uh, water in its interior without exchange. So when you find these lambda loops, we consider them as the boundary of a coherent Lagrangian eddy. And they apply this method to um, Agolas eddies. Um, so each color show one eddy being at one eddy, one lambda loop, right? So a coherent Lagrangian eddy being advected. Um, so they found eight eddies and that were coherent for 20, uh, 225 days. And as a comparison, they tried to track the evolution of the boundary of a SSH counter. And this SSH counter got very filamented after a few time steps. So this showed that relative vorticity and SSH are not good uh, parameters to study coherence. We need something more sophisticated to actually um, check if the frontal edges are coherent or not. So um, I, so uh, George Holler and Bernadette developed this method, and Daniel Karash also uh, coded it in Julian. And I'll this is the code that I, I'm using for my analysis, and I'll explain uh, the steps that this code is. Um, doing to find these lambda loops. So the first step, it calculates trajectory. So let's say I have, I start from time one to time 17 days. Um, this is the example that I used. And so it calculates trajectories all around. I had to put a resolution much lower because my model has, uh, the model that I use has resolution of one kilometer here. I lower to 25 kilometers, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything, but you can see the pattern of the loop current and the loop current frontal is around it. So once you have the position at time zero and the fine position at time t, you can calculate the flow map that describes the evolution of the fluid. So the flow map calculates the displacement of the particles. For example, if you have four particles here at time zero and at time t, they're going to be in different places. The flow map actually um, takes into account the displacement and x and y of the particle. And from the flow map, you can calculate the Cauchy green strain tensor fields um, just using the gradients um, in X and Y of the flow map. So if you have four particles here that are shown in a uh, well-defined square, at time T, if they advect in a different form, you end up with another polygon. So this fluid was deformed. And what the Cauchy green strain tensor shows is how the fluid is being deformed from time zero to time t. Um, and from the Cauchy Green strain tensor field, you obtain two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors. So for each trajectory, you obtain these two eigenvectors and two eigenvalues. Um, and I plotted the maximum eigenvalue, so uh, from the two. So this color map shows maximum eigenvalue are shown by uh, the yellow colors. And you can see where stretching is more important. So I'll describe you what you're seeing here because um, it might be a bit confusing, but you see 
the loop current over here and you see something swirling. So it's a loop current frontal eddy that I am trying to identify with this method. This is the color map. The vector field is actually eta that I won't get into much details, but they're calculated using the eigenvectors and normalized by the eigenvalues and use the lambda parameter of one. And this lambda parameter is the stretching parameter that I mentioned, that we're looking for the lambda loops, right? That is being stretched by this lambda parameter equally around all the boundary. So how do we find this loop? Once we have this vector, we calculated the tangential lines uh, to these vectors to find the strain lines. And so once you have the strain lines, which are just the tangent of this vector field, we obtain, uh, we look for the strain lines that are closed loops. So this closed loop show that they're being stretched by the same factor lambda, right? So then we find our coherent eddy. So you're just looking at this map, you see this um, yellow lines that show high stretching. And you see this vector, you might tell me that uh, um, the direction, so you, you shouldn't look at the direction, The sorry, you should, what matters in this vector are the direction and not the orientation. So um, you're gonna see some vectors are pointed at each other, but that doesn't really matter because when you take the tangent to those vectors, you're gonna, what matters is um, the direction. And so when I use this code for this specific case, I found a lambda loop in this area, which um, it's in agreement to what we see um, with the eta vectors and the eigenvalue values. So there is an eddy here in a coherent eddy that remains coherent for 17 days. Okay, that was the theory. Uh, I apply this method using the one kilometer resolution free run model. Um, so it's the same one that I use for my chapter two. And just a reminder, HICOM has pressure levels near the surface and isopic no coordinates in the open ocean. So I apply this method for two specific cases um, of loop current shedding, one in 1999 and another one in 2001. And you have a SSH from the model. The black line is the loop current and the white line is, if you remember from my first chapter, is the negative 28 centimeter that I define as the loop current frontal eddy, but you can ignore it from now. I just plotted to compare, but uh, it's not very useful in this chapter. And you have these loops over here. And these loops, they show the variation of the boundary of the, the coherent eddy over time. So I found that for this case, the frontal eddy remains coherent for 17 days. And for this case, the eddy remains coherent for 10 days. Um, and the red line is actually the counter at um, time zero. Um, and then you have the 17 counters for this case and the 10 yellow counters uh, for the 10 following days for this case. This is for the surface. I also look at lower layers to see how the coherence change at lower layers. And I found that um, actually the coherence of the frontal eddies increase as you look at the lower layers. So for 100 meters, I found a coherence of 20 days. And for 250 meters, I found a coherence of 23 days. You can see that the, the loops are much larger and they actually um, exist for 23 days. So uh, these edges are much more coherent, well, more coherent at lower layers, which is expected since at the surface, you have much more variability of the winds and, um, and other factors, waves, tides, um, and, and other flows that um, interfere in this coherence. Okay, so after finding that the frontal edges can remain coherent for weeks, I uh, placed particle, I took one, this case of 1999, place 6,000 particles inside the contour of the loop of coherence for time zero, and I advect these particles. So what we expect is that these particles remain in these yellow loops, and they remain coherent, right? And I did this advection uh, applying a fourth order Runge-Kutta method um, to the velocity field. I have a little video here. Um, 
This is for the case of coherence of for 17 days. And you can see that these particles, they're moving around, but they remain coherent, which is um, showing that the code worked well and we were able to identify um, the coherence loop for the frontal edges. So this is for if I advect forward, but if I advect backward, which was what I was interested, I can find where the water that builds this Lagrangian coherence comes from. And this is what I'm mostly interested in. And I uh, put together then the backward and the forward advection, and I made this video to find where the water comes from. And I'll play for you here. Um, the red line, they're not gonna move. Um, they, they're static there. The red line is the coherent loop for time zero. And then I plot the coherent loops in the following days for every four, day, every four days has a loop. Um, so you can see these particles of water and I'll stop for a second because you can see that there's water coming from all the surroundings, some water coming from the loop current front, but you also see water coming from the west of Florida shelf a little bit over here and some on the north part of the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. This I thought was very interesting. Um, you also have one vortex merging over here. It converges and then it fills the loop for the first time step and remains coherent for 17 days until the loop current shedding. I did the same video for the case of 250 meters uh, where I found 23 days of coherence. And I just wanted to compare and show that the spread is much smaller. Most of the particles actually come from small frontal edges that merge. So there is this vertex merging that were uh, I was were already um, identified in on in previous studies. And then and there we go. And then fills the loop for um, time zero and remains coherent for 23 days. So we show with the model that the frontal edges, when they're getting stronger and creating this coherent loop, they um, also extract and attract water from uh, the, the shelf. And so I wanted to look at observations to see if you can observe the same thing. And I used the Drifter data set that uh, Jonathan Lilly uh, put together last year. And it, he took all the drifters available in the Gulf of Mexico. There's around 2,000 drifters um, or trajectories available for the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And I look at them, and you find some of them following the loop current and getting trained uh, inside the frontal edges. But what I'm mostly interested in is the one that comes from the west of Florida shelf. So you have here one example of frontal edge of, of a, sorry, a drifter that was in the west of Florida shelf that crossed the isobath and got entrained in a frontal edge. And here there is, I, I, I'm just showing a couple of them to you, but there is many cases where you observe this eddies um, getting entrained. This one actually um, got caught and uh, remained for many days inside the frontal eddy. This one coming from the north, and you have these other cases here. Um, something I wanted to point out is that there is, it, 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 there is, um, something called the forbidden zone that um, Josefina Oasquaga studied in many different papers. And it's actually, um, they showed in their, their studies that there is a cross shelf barrier in the west of Florida shelf um, that don't allow crossing from the water close to the coast to offshore. And uh, what it seems to be happening for this case, for example, is that the barrier is a little closer to the coast, because although we see some particles coming from the, 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 the shelf, we don't see any drifter coming from very close, for example, Tampa and crossing in. So this barrier is um, simply moving um, back and forth. But the point is there is sh uh, shelf water coming from the shelf to offshore waters. So this can be seen more clearly when you look at chlorophyll. This is another case of frontal eddy intensification. You see these filaments of high chlorophyll being attracted around the frontal eddies. And uh, 
and and not only chlorophyll because if chlorophyll is being infected then you also assume that fresh water and other properties are also being infected in the front uh, in the frontal item so the frontal items they intensify they can attract particles in its center they can carry and transport it from one place to another and they can advect particles from the shelf to uh, the offshore region um, Last, um, these are the last analysis that I'm showing you. I looked at uh, the water mass properties of the frontal iris, and uh, this is using observations. So these are X uh, expendable CTDs, so they are launched from the um, the aircraft NOAA, the NOAA P3, and uh, they um, measure profiles of temperature and salinity. So I look at the water mass of the loop current, that it's known to be closer to the south, uh, the subtropical waters. And you have, on the other hand, the Gulf Common water, which is the water characteristic of the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, with properties much close to the signal of Gulf Common water, which makes sense. And when you look at the loop current front, you find a, a uh, range of water mass between the loop current and the Gulf Common water. And the point is that I want to show is here that the loop current frontal is they actually much closer to the Gulf Common water properties than the loop current. So the water, um, the properties actually are being conserved and um, they're much closer to the properties of the surrounding of the loop current. And when I look at the model, I actually found the same results. I look at the surrounding, the front loop current and uh, inside the loop current frontal eddy. And I found it again that the TS properties of the frontal eddies much closer to um, the Gulf Common water than to the loop current, which is in agreement with previous studies. So conclusion of chapter three uh, is that the frontal eddies can remain coherent for weeks, um, 17 days at the surface for the 1999 case, and the coherence increase at lower depth. Um, the intensification of the frontal eddies, uh, they actually attract particles for the surrounding. So the Lagrangian, the frontal eddy Lagrangian coherence builds up from particles from the loop current, but also from the surrounding, and they can drive cross-shelf shelf exchange. So they can attract water from the shelf to um, the offshore region. And the TS properties of the frontal eddies is more similar to Gulf Common water, so the surrounding, than um, to the loop current. So the future work, I'm going to be looking at relative vorticity budget um, and try to understand what are the terms that are the most involved in the acceleration of the relative vorticity. And I also wanted to look a little bit of vertical velocity because I've seen some preliminary results and uh, vol vertical velocity is quite important in this area. And as a summary of my whole presentation, um, the frontal eddies, so this divided in chapters, Loop current frontal eddy intensification is dependent on the loop current front. Um, the front, the, the front between the frontal eddy and the loop current intensifies and becomes deeper when you have frontal eddy intensification. And it also leads to a horizontal temperature gradient increase, a increase in local available potential energy and also the Rosby number. The second chapter, we saw that the, front, the loop current meanders are in gradient wind balance, so the geostrophic flow is important. And in the third chapter, we saw that loop current frontal eddies can remain coherent for weeks, um, and that this coherence builds up from water, from the loop current, but also from the surrounding, and can drive cross-shelf exchanges. So the frontal eddies, they're not just passive features that are generated through baroclinic instability, they also play a role they can get very strong and they can deform the loop current and modify the surrounding flow. And that's all I have. Thank you. Wow, that was a great talk, Luna. Um, let's give a virtual round of applause to Luna. Um, so I could definitely watch those uh, videos of the water parcels becoming coherent all day. I love that would it. be awesome. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to the questions part. You feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you want to put it in the chat, I'm happy to ask it for you. I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, safe. Of course. Um, yeah, the trajectory uh, animations are, are great. Um, uh, I think I'm wondering if you could test the robustness uh, let me put it back. I'm wondering to what extent that result is defined by when you define the time that you define your eddy, like your 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 coherent structure. 
And so you have particles from like all over the Gulf converging on this one point. And then amazingly, they stay together for the next 20 days. So, um, uh, you know, how confident you are of that and, and thinking maybe you could test the robustness by like going forward 10 days and then doing the reverse trajectories and see if they go back through the eddy and then spread out over the Gulf. Well, that should be the same thing. Um... It, would be, it would be. I mean, it would be a test to make sure that that's not, uh, that, that, that that's right. Well, I expect it to be the same because when I calculated forward and they remain coherent for this eddy. So um, if I take the final position, I do it backward, then I'll end up at this counter and come back. But when you said, um, when you so, talk about the, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I'm just saying like, so if you take that blob right there and go backwards from there, you know, oh, will you back right? to... This, but I'm saying what, you know, that would be a test, right? If you go backward, if you go backwards from here, would you go back to the red circle and then spread out over the Gulf and probably not to exactly the same points, but in some similar distribution? Mm -hmm. uh, well, if if, um, if my code is right, then you should end up at the same position. Uh, that's something to do. But then when you mention about the time actual of coherence, um, that I don't know if that's what you meant, but it's a good point is that if I took, for example, this case, 17 days of coherence. If I take 10 days of coherence, I'm gonna end up with a different counters and my particles are gonna come from different directions, but- Okay, so that's the question. How is, you know, what, how is the time of that red line defined? Like that so red line is the circle at a certain date, right? How is that chosen? So what I wanted to find is um, how long they can remain coherent up to the shedding. So I took the day of the shedding and I mm -hmm. test for five days before. So I took, let's say, time five to time 10 and find what are my, uh, the contour of coherence for um, coherent eddies, look, eddies that remain coherent for five days. And then if I found a, a circle, I increased one day, one day, and I went up to 17. When I went to 18, I didn't find any cont any loop. So, so this, red no line, this red line is defined by a backward calculation. No, sorry, no. It's it, it's forward. It's forward. It's like I, in my in my head, like I'm I'm going backwards, but in the code, it's going forward. Does it make sense? Uh, not quite. I mean, I think okay. this is a detail we can discuss another time. But I guess I'm just saying there's a way to test the robustness of this by basically taking your eddy at the end time, running that backwards, and seeing that go back to the eddy at the start of the time, and then back all over the goal. Well, uh, I can do that, but like. I, if my code is right, then it should be the same position. It should end up, they should be um, overlapped. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, we have Lisa Beal has a question. Hey, Luna. Um, Hi, Lisa. This was an awesome talk. You should be very proud of this work. Thank you. Um, my question is, you know, the beginning of your talk you were saying that um, part of your motivation for this study was to improve the predictability um, of loop current eddy shedding. Um, so I'm interested in sort of coming back to that and asking you then how you see your work contributing to predictability. Great question. Um, so already I feel like showing that the frontal eddies and, and the loop current meanders are in gradient wind balance. I feel that's a way to show that because when we think about tools and observations to be deployed in the Gulf of Mexico, we have to take into account to study the flow that central Gulf force is important. I think that's one point. Um, another point is that uh, there is this linear nonlinear interaction between the loop current frontal eddy and the loop current that have to take be taken into account. Uh, but then the details of how this is implemented um, in the models, that's a bit too far of, of my paper. Um, we know that they have, they, this frontal light is intensifying, they play an important role in the shedding, but uh, maybe improving their, or, or sorry, better solved their dynamics. So taking into account when they intensify and how they interact with the loop current would help um, defining or uh, better predict when the shedding will happen. So one of the first things that I can think is resolution. We have to be able to resolve 
not only the baroclinic part that's, that generates large eddy on the east side, but also the barotropic part that generate very small eddies on the west uh, part of the loop current. And, um, and I feel there's another thing that I found out in my third chapter, uh, I haven't looked too much into that, is that the vertical velocity is important. So how much of the vertical velocity uh, is actually being taken into account in models? We know that most models are hydros in hydrostatic balance. So um, is that affecting when the prediction of the loop current shedding? That's something I don't know, but that's, I think that's an important point to be thinking about when you talk about improving forecast models. Did I answer your question? Well, I went a bit too far. <laughs> okay, that's great. I know we've got one more question from Matu. Hi, hi Luna. Very, very hi, good. Hi Matu. Thank you very much. Very good talk. Thank uh, you. My, yeah, I, have my, I have a question. So you showed all those particles coming from everywhere and then being coherent within the loop current frontal eddy. What happens to them after after those 17 days? Where do they go? That's a great question. I didn't advect enough, uh, but I'll, I'll do that and I'll go back to you. Okay. I would expect that they spread a little bit, but they should probably part of it flow the loop current and maybe I don't know. I'll, I'll check and then I, I'll go back to you. Maybe they are so close to the West Florida shelf. Do they come back to the West Florida shelf? That'd be interesting. Maybe that would be something interesting to look at. Yes. Thank I you. I had another question related to what uh, the uh, discussion you had with, with David. So you, when you answered to David, you said that you focused on the time when the, the loop current frontal ladies were interacting, leading to a shedding, <laughs> right? But um, you showed one a uh, drifter from the database from Lily et al. And the one on the left, that the trajectory on the, from the drifter on the left, it was, uh, Sorry. The drifter was embedded in, yeah, that one. Just before, before. Oh, this one. Yeah, this one on the left. The, the looping of that drifter inside the cyclonic eddy was for four months. So if you take an eddy maybe earlier in its life, st uh, li life stage, maybe you will get coherence for much longer times. Oh, this one over here, right? On the left. This is actually the one that you observed in your paper, right? Yeah. With the oh, drifter. Well, I know that one pretty well. But so <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm thinking if you do this type of analysis for a frontal eddy maybe earlier uh, along the eastern part of the loop current, you might get uh, coherence for much longer times than 17 days. So. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking when you when you were. Mm -hmm. I I just look at two cases. Um, I I should look take a look at more cases. Actually, I feel one place that it's a bit tricky mm -hmm. that I realized every time that I was doing this coherence study, or at least for the two cases, that it lost coherence at that point is here when mm -hmm. the eddy gets a bit like squeezed, and I think because it gets between this area between the loop current and the bathymetry. Um, and then this is where I saw the end of coherence for the two cases that I saw, yeah. but I, but yeah, that's a very great point. I want to look at other cases and see if I can find more coherence. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Um, well, thank you everybody. Luna, maybe you can send those four trajectory videos out on info. Cause I think we'd all like to see them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you everybody. Let's give Luna one more round of applause. Thanks right, everyone great talk. for coming. See <laughs> bye you bye. next Wednesday with Anthony Didlake. Bye everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye.